Peixe grelhado ou marisco, uh, ele agradece. Jay, venha para o palco, você é a estrela. Um, um salve de palmas para o Jay. Jay Cross. Bom dia. Ok. Picture, action, magic. Now, actually, the things that I want to share with you aren't my ideas. I mean, I, I work closely with four other people, and we're online every day. We're a community of practice, and our ideas are so intermingled that we can no longer figure out this is yours and this is mine and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be sharing ideas from my friends in the UK and Canada and across North America. I saw this sign, a bank window in Scotland. Staff training, to allow time for staff training, this branch will open each Wednesday at 9.30. Because learning was different from work. And if any of you are involved in corporate training, I'm sure you've seen the howls from managers when you say, oh, we're going to have a training program. They go, no, no, you can't take people away from work. Well, hold it. It might have been true in the past that learning was separate from work. But now, because things are happening so quickly, work and learning are becoming exactly the same thing. This is Berkeley, California. I live about a mile from the campus. I'm not affiliated with the university. <laughs> Schools usually hate me, uh, <clears throat> and I hate them back. But, <clears throat> but it, it, Berkeley is where I wrote this book on informal learning. And I want to walk you through some of the, the basics of informal learning as I see it, where we'll be able to talk about how it might fit into your situation. Uh, Happily, my Brazilian friends translated slides into Portuguese, so don't have to uh, go and rework all of the graphics. But informal learning, well, some of this you can read for yourself, I guess. I mean, informal learning, the unofficial, unscheduled, impromptu way people learn to do their jobs. In fact, it used to be, before we had the internet, that when we looked, 80% of the way people learn their jobs was on the job. It was through seeing somebody who's a good performer, it was by trying something out, it didn't work, it's by asking somebody in the next cubicle, that sort of thing. I suspect now it's more like 95% because social networks, things like that, communities of practice, enable you to do informal learning a lot easier. I can't remember if it's coming up, so I'll just mention sort of what is informal learning. To me, informal learning is learning without a curriculum. It's where the learner decides what the content's going to be. It's often driven by a need to know. I want to do something, I'm going to go find out about it. I remember being at a conference in the Middle East about 10 years ago, and this was sort of new stuff at the time. And this uh, executive vice president of IBM walks up to me and goes, well, how do you know this works? And I was flabbergasted. He said, huh? How do you know this informal learning works? I said, how did you learn to talk? How did you learn to walk? How did you learn to kiss a girl? Did you go to school for that? Did you attend a class? No, it was informal learning. So in informal learning is the way we learn a whole lot of different things. Um, Humans are sight mammals. When I look at curriculum, training courses, at stuff in corporations, it's all text. I think, hold it, we're missing something here. I mean, that, that's, that's not the way that we're really wired to do things. Hence, I like to use pictures. Um, if you're not using pictures, it's sort of, well, why not? I don't want my Macintosh to slip off here. <laughs> Conversation. I've looked all over the world at different learning technologies. I mean, I've seen more learning management systems than I ever want to see again. But by and large, the most powerful learning technology I've ever seen is simply human conversation. 
and we'll come back to this when I look at what can you do about this stuff. Often, if you can foster more meaningful conversation in the workplace, more learning happens, and you don't have to take it that much further than that. Communities of practice. People naturally form communities, and they may be around something we know about, a group of people we identify with, sometimes a group of people are working on a common task. And this is a marvelous thing where you can harness this energy without trying to control it, but just letting it happen. Now let me talk a little bit about the economics, because talking about this just at theory level doesn't quite get there. We said that 80%, the big red line, of learning on the job or more is informal. And yet 80% or more, the big blue line, of the money that's spent is on formal. It, it, it almost looks as if this is mainly corporations. It's corporations are taking their money and putting it where it's going to do the least good. It's crazy. Why is that? Well, I have to say first that learning isn't just formal or informal. It's always a mix of both. So when I say formal, I mean more formal than informal. When I say inform more informal than formal. So if, if I'm formal, say I'm going to school, I've got a formal class, I've got a curriculum, all that, but I'm still learning a lot from talking with my friends or working in a study group, informal. So it, it's always a mix. And the stuff that's more formal is often the way that somebody who's new at something learns. It's for novices. I compare it to riding a bus. I mean, it's same size fits all. The bus is going the same place, no matter what you need in particular. If you're hungry, it's not gonna stop. It's not gonna be personalized. The bus is gonna go on the regular bus route. Often, formal learning takes place in events. And like a bus ride, it ends. Now, you know, I have a Portuguese version as well. Now let's think about when informal learning is appropriate. It's appropriate for most people, people who've got experience. They know the lay of the land. They're no longer novices. They don't have to learn every little thing. And their behavior is more like riding a bike. If you're, I, I live on a hill. I see people riding bikes up all the time. And if, if somebody's tired, they stop. And if they're hungry, they pull over at a restaurant. And interestingly enough, if, if one person breaks down, the next person stops to help them. And informal learning is precisely like this. You go where you want to go. You go at your own pace. There's another benefit to it, of course. If you learn things because you needed to know it, usually you're going to do something immediately thereafter, and it's going to be reinforced, so there's a much better chance that you're going to retain it. Most things that we learn in formal settings are forgotten before they are applied. That's why only 15% of what occurs in corporate workshops ever shows up on the job. So we have the informal learning, like riding a bike, self-determined. So what we see is that there's this pattern over someone's career where you start out with more on the formal side and then you end up with more on the informal side. Now, what if I look at those two pieces separately and I sort of divide them up? And here's why people spend the money in the wrong place. Because training departments and HR departments are used to running bus routes because they know how to copy school, because they know how to give basic stuff, even though most of the learning that goes on in the organization is with experienced people. And increasingly, when you've got to keep up with the changing pace, everybody's going to be learning all the time. Most of those people are going to be experienced people. So it's the situation that we've got is the money is going into training the novices rather than helping the experienced people learn. And I'll suggest, and I don't have any numbers to back this up, this just sort of seems logical to me, that if we took 
some of the spending that we've done on formal learning and we moved it down to the informal, then we might have something like this. Outsized returns. Because most people don't spend any money at all improving informal learning. And well look, there are a number of ways you can do that. So is, is this making sense to people? Yeah? No? This is a very quiet crowd. We're gonna have a hard time getting questions out of this group. Yeah. <laughs> this group, yeah. <laughs> Or maybe I'm just off today, I don't know. Uh, th this thing was not made for a Macintosh. The machine keeps sliding down as I go. But it's sort of, well, what types of things can you do? Um, let's see, there we can go. Well, I said conversation's important. You can have a lot of room for conversation. When I visit companies in Silicon Valley, I live about an hour north, they never have enough conference rooms. To get to a little conference room, you have to book the thing a week in advance. Well, this is crazy. It means that people can't easily get together and talk about things and learn from one another. Profiles, locators. I mean, a basic thing in any company that's got more than 50 people, it better be a list somewhere of who knows what and how to find them. Because otherwise, people are just bouncing around looking for answers. They don't know where their expertise is. Uh, social networking. Well, I think some of the questions will, will deal with social networking. Trial and error. Giving people permission to make mistakes where they can experiment and learn from what they're doing. Uh, search technology. A part of this is stuff's got to be findable. When I go into a company and all the information is like hidden in file cabinets, or email, I mean, email is where knowledge goes to die. Email is sinful, it's bad. Because unless it's just one to one, it's shutting out everybody else's ability to look and see what's going on. And hiding stuff in file cabinets used to be knowledge is power. Yeah, that, that's not true anymore. Now sharing knowledge is power. We got.